When I was asked to come talk today, I wanted to pick some, some topics that I thought you might be interested in. Some of the residents uh, approached me and asked for me to co cover a few topics. Um, so first off, what are we going to cover today? Um, we're going to go over some items in pre with pressure ulcers, then we'll move into dressing choices, um, venous ul uh, some items in venous ulcers and arterial ulcers. And the, when we're discussing pressure ulcers, I want to go over staging first, and I'll, you'll see why I think it's important you know about this in more detail in a moment. Um, we'll discuss offloading and prevention. A little bit about surgical management. Not being a surgeon, I'm not going to tell you uh, how to do your surgeries, obviously, because I don't know. Um, and I'll leave that to uh, some of the plastic surgeons to discuss with you. Um, and then we'll transition into dressing choices, because the kinds of dressings that we might want to use with a pressure ulcer use the same concepts of the kind of dressings we would use with other types of ulcers. So why, it, why do I want to talk to you about staging? Because it's more important than you realize. Um, many of you probably heard of the Never 27 list before, of the 27 things that CMS says that should never, ever happen in a hospitalization. And if they happen, it's really, really bad. Um, and on this list, it states any stage three, stage four, or unpressure, uh, unstageable pressure ulcer acquired after admission or presentation to a healthcare facility. And these are DHS reportable. They can cost the hospital tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and as you can imagine, whenever you get the government to come out and say these are 27 things that should never happen, if they do happen, it's a plaintiff's attorney's wet dream. I mean, this is just kind of like, let's file the case. Let's not even look at the documentation yet. We'll just file it because we know you're not supposed to have it. Um, and when I go over staging, what I want to tell you is if you're going to do it, it's really important you do it right because if it's not documented correctly, it, that's where it really becomes difficult if there is a lawsuit. So you, I'm sure all heard about the NPUAP staging system. You may not have known that's who came up with it, but there's a National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. And a stage one ulcer, and I, I provided you some diagrams and also some pictures because it can be confusing at times which stage we're talking about. Well, stage one just means that we have had some kind of injury to the dermis. It's going to manifest as this, this red, non-blanchable erythema that you see in the picture in the right. Um, uh, and um, so it, it can be harder to appreciate in patients with darker skin. Um, I'm sure you've all probably seen this on many patients um, in the ICU or, or where have you. Um, and these are not obviously too severe, um, but, uh, but we need to, you need to be careful when you start to see them. Where, when we move up the ladder to a higher stage, stage two, this is still uh, confined to the dermis. And this is where we start to get some confusion, where people start to call things stage two that really aren't. Um, and if, if it goes all the way through and there's any exposed structure underneath, it is no longer a stage two. This picture on the right is just a blister that has been decompressed. Basically, that's what you're going to see when you see a stage two usually, is a blister, because it's a partial thickness injury. And you'll notice there's no slough in the base of this blister. Once you have slough, that means that there has been damage that is, further, that is deeper than the dermis. Um, and so I think most people would look at this and say, yeah, that's not very deep. That's probably a stage two. The problem is, is that the, there's conf I think a lot of people get confused about what is a stage three. A stage three just means it's now a full thickness wound. It has violated the dermis. It's into the subcutaneous layer, but not past the fascia yet. Um, and if you see in this picture on the right, that's a very shallow looking wound. And so I think a lot of people are tempted to look at that and say, Oh, that's shallow. There's no way I would ever consider surgery for something like that. Therefore, that must be a stage two pressure ulcer. But the fact that there's the presence of slough shows you that it has violated the, the dermis, is into the sum of the subcutaneous tissue at least a little bit, and is by definition a stage three. So where we run into documentation problems is someone comes in the hospital, someone sees this, and says, stage two. And now, three days later, this has gotten deeper. It's more obvious that it is into the subcutaneous layers. And someone documents stage three. And so now we have a DHS reportable event because we admitted this patient and said they didn't have a stage three when they got here. They, have, they had a stage two. Now they have a stage three. Um, and so, so we have to report that. Um, the DHS will send a reviewer to come look at the case. And fortunately, the reviewers, I think, I don't know, the, the SWAT nurses have to deal with that. I don't actually ever talk to these people. Uh, I, hopefully, they, they, they kind of look and say, yeah, that was not staged right. 
But a plaintiff's attorney is not going to think, say that. They're going to think, oh, this is great. I've got at least $50,000 coming because they're going to settle for at least something. Um, stage four means that we've violated into the fascia. Um, so the presence of visible fascia makes a stage four. The presence of muscle makes it a stage four. Obviously, bone and ligament make it a stage four. And this picture on the right is just showing that you know, we have some either fascia or ligamentous tissue visible in there. Um, so that, by definition, is a stage four. It doesn't have to be down to the bone to be a stage four. Um, the next category, which is also reportable, is we call an unstageable pressure ulcer. That just means you don't know how deep it is. Um, so that can be the presence of slough or eschar. These are two examples where we can't tell how deep they are. We know that there is obvious tissue damage. There's eschar present. And until you do some form of debridement to determine the depth of it, you can't determine whether it's a three or a four. As far as management goes, they're not going to be that different. Um, we already know this is a three or a four pressure ulcer. Um, uh, uh, but this is the technical definition for this. Where it becomes a little more confusing is what is a deep tissue pressure injury. Um, because this is not a reportable uh, uh, thing, even though this is clearly something bad going on underneath. And this is where I find a lot of problems with where we end up with staging problems um, with documentation that become a potential problem with uh, lawsuits in the future. What happens, the pathophysiology of pressure injury, um, the skin is actually stronger at resisting the forces of pressure than the underlying fat and muscle tissue. And just based on the, the, the physics of it, if you think of the triangle where the bone is at the base of the triangle, that's the part with the most pressure. The skin has less pressure on it when there's some insult, whether there's a paralyzed patient sitting in a chair or on a bed incapacitated for hours. So that's the part that dies first. And so when it first dies, you're going to get just some discoloration under the tissue. It might start to bleed. It'll start to get echomotic. And someone might first just see a red hue, and they'll say, oh, this is a stage one pressure ulcer. Then they'll start to see it blister. I'm like, oh, that's a stage two pressure ulcer. And it might actually have just some partial thickness breakdown of the skin at first. And they'll document that as a stage two, two ulcer. And then a few days later, it now actually breaks down and is draining. And it's obvious it's into the bone. And it's a stage four pressure ulcer. Again, we've documented this picture for a plaintiff's attorney to show we, we let this wound worsen throughout our entire care. And we, we, what we did was not effective. We didn't do anything. It didn't get better. So what I say, and I've been actually doing legal reviews um, since 2010. I've reviewed over 30 cases now. I now get retained by, by attorneys probably four or five times a year. The majority of the cases I get retained on are um, pressure ulcers. And when I first started doing this, um, it was hospitals, home health agencies, nursing facilities. Sometimes nurses were named, not usually nurses by name, but it could occasionally be. Rarely physicians. That has changed. In the last few years, I am now, I have, I have representing a physician in one case. Um, uh, and I think the reason it's changed is that never 27 list. Um, I also think that because the medical records are such that everything is there for you to see, the pictures are there for you to see, and I think a lot of, especially older physicians, have been this attitude, well, this is a nursing problem. This is a, in the nursing realm of scope of practice. And I, you need to be fair warned that that is that the plaintiff's attorneys are deciding to now name physicians. These are high-risk patients for you because they're in the ICU for a long time. Um, and, and it's very common for them to get pressure ulcers. And they're not all unavoidable. You can be doing the exact right thing, um, and they can still get them. So what I would say on this pressure ulcer staging that we just talked about is that if you don't feel comfortable calling it what stage it is, don't call it a stage. Just describe what you see. I see a partial thickness wound with slough. I see a full thickness wound with exposed fascia. That is perfectly acceptable. I don't think unless you're actually doing surgery on this wound, um, I don't think you have to stage it if you don't feel comfortable staging it. So just I wanted to go over, not that you're going to do a Braden scale, but just to show you how does the nursing staff assess these patients. This isn't a perfect scale, um, but it's what's used in this hospital and many other ones to assess for the risk of developing a pressure ulcer. It's scored from 6 to 23. The higher, the better. Um, and there are six categories. They assess sensory perception, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, 
friction and shear. Um, and if patients have a 19 or higher, which everybody in this room does, you're not considered at risk. But if it's 15 to 18, uh, the patients should be getting regular turning. They should be active as possible. The heels need to be protected and inspected. They should be on a pressure redistributing surface, which all our patients in this hospital are, um, and manage uh, moisture, nutrition, friction, and shear. Uh, if the risk is now moderate, the patient needs to be um, on a 30 degree lateral incline with wedges when they're turned from side to side. If they're high risk, make small shifts in position, and if they're very high risk, the recommendation is to use a better mattress. Now, what about these offloading surfaces? There are many, many types of mattresses. They can be extremely expensive. What is the data to, on this? And the Cochrane database reviews this, and they probably publish an update about once every four years. And most interestingly, now, the 2015 did have some changes. 2011, they said, we can't tell any difference between any of these mattresses. Now, um, as better studies have come out, they've been able to show that there is a, a risk reduction of 0.4 in using a pressure-reducing foam mattress versus just a standard hospital mattress. Um, also very important for you guys, the operating room table. These patients are paralyzed or sedated. They're on that table sometimes for over 12 hours. Um, th it's very important that they also be on a pressure-reducing re overlay. Um, the question is, what about the more expensive mattresses such as the alternating pressure, low air loss mattress? The data is not clear if it's at all useful for preventative measures. But even though we don't have a lot of really good data because this is a hard thing to study, we still know that it's important. Um, the standard of care says that patients should be repositioned every two hours. Honestly, no one knows. Is that the right answer? Should it be 30 minutes, 45 minutes, two hours, four hours? No one really knows the answer to that question. Um, uh, and then when, when we tilt them, how much is good enough? Is 30 degrees good enough? Is 90 degrees? Do they have to be completely on their side? No one really knows. But even though we don't really know, we know it's something. We got to do something. We know it's important. Um, I would say that if someone has a new pressure ulcer or has a worsening pressure ulcer, that's the time to go ahead and order a better mattress, whether that's an alternating pressure mattress, low air loss mattress, dolphin mattress. You may have heard of Clinitron. Those are the air fluidized ones. Those aren't actually used that much anymore because they just break up. They, they break too often. And so I know that the plastic surgeons here typically like the dolphin mattress for patients who are um, after their flap surgeries. Another thing that's really important, especially if you already operated on somebody with a pressure ulcer, is pressure seat mapping. You know, these patients spend a lot more time in their chair than they're supposed to, more than they, certainly more than they'll tell you. I think it's kind of like, I know what they say with someone, you ask them how much they drink, assume it's like two or three times more. Exact same thing with asking a paralyzed patient how often do they sit in their chair? Um, uh, physical therapy at CRH does have the ability to do pressure mapping. It's a very good resource. They have many different cushions that they can try the patient on and see where they're getting pressure, modify them, make different recommendations. Um, and certainly if someone's going to get operated on, they have to have pressure seat mapping. Otherwise, it's just going to fail and you're going to have to do it again. So surgical management, there are no good randomized controlled trials of conservative versus reconstructive surgery. A couple of years ago, Sean Diamond started a trial on this, but it, we just didn't really get going. Um, we do know that serial debridement of necrotic tissue in wounds in general, in patients followed at wound centers, there's been studies done that those who get regular weekly serial debridements do heal faster than those who don't. Um, now, our approach here is early reconstructive surgery. Um, when I first uh, came here, I would, you know, let's see how the wound vac works. Let's try this, let's try that, and these, some of these deeper ulcers. And it very rarely works if somebody's got, you know, tunneling. Um, and so we've really moved to uh, seeing somebody on their first visit and arranging their plastic surgery consultation for the next visit. Um, we found quicker healing. Um, I think they have less time to get infected and get osteomyelitis. They have a faster return to their regular activities. And we have seen improvement in our healing rates and decreased average time to heal. So I think that that um, early reconstructive approach is the correct approach. Now let's move on to, to dressings. You know, what is it that we do? I, I know when I was in residency, we only, I only knew of two things, wet to dry dressings and duoderm. That was it. If you've got a pressure ulcer, you get duoderm. Everything else, you get wet to dry. Um, well, what is the rationale for wound care? What, what do wound care doctors and nurses do? We try to do moist wound healing. There's an optimum level of moisture in a wound. Just like your, you know, your, the, the, the extracellular matrix, you don't want things too dry or too wet. 
When the wounds are dried out, the epithelial cells and fibroblasts don't grow as well, and you can desiccate and damage and kill the tissue. But when wounds are too wet, then you're going to end up getting maceration and you have increased risk of infection. So we want to pick dressings that are going to give us this Goldilocks kind of environment, not too wet, not too dry. And there are many, many different types of dressing choices. There are certainly over a thousand different brands of dressings. Um, there's, of course, gauze and transparent films. There's things called alginates, hydrogels, hydrocolloids, foams, interactives, and composites. And so what I'd like to do is kind of give you Instead of just saying this dressing does that, is kind of is give you an idea of, well, if you see this, what dressing should I be considering? And so usually it's based on the amount of drainage. So patients who have moderate or heavy drainage are going to need dressings that are able to absorb that. Typically in our hospital and our wound center, we're using alginates. Alginates were originally made from seaweed. Now they are usually synthetically made. They are highly absorbent. And what happens is they end up creating a gel-like substance um, with the wound exudate. And they can absorb up to 20 times their weight. Uh, so one of the advantages to that is that we can typically get these patients to go two or three days between dressing changes, which is really important when home health does not want to go out once a day. Maybe they'll go out for a week, but they're not going to go out once a day for three, four weeks. Um, Examples of what we carry on your left is just a sheet of Aquacel or, or an alginate. On the right is these, these uh, packing strips. The packing strips have, have thread sewn into them so they don't fall apart when you try to remove them. And because they do form a gel, they don't have as much pain with removal of the tissue growing into the weave. Frequently, we will use silver impregnated dressings because silver is antimicrobial. Another example of a product we use here in the hospital is MediHoney, which is a calcium alginate dressing infused with Manuka honey. Honey does, has been shown to have uh, healing properties that, due to um, some of the enzymes that are in them. Um, sugar actually does inhibit micro uh, uh, bacterial growth as well. And I, I really like the MediHoney quite a lot. We've been using it here for about a year. Um, and in the hospital, it's certainly not a problem. In an outpatient, it's kind of interesting. I can't always get it because there's a lot of honey in there. And a number of the insurers, because of the rules they have, say, I'm sorry, we don't cover food. If there's more than 50% honey, it's food, which is really annoying because this stuff works very well. But it is an option here in the hospital, something you can certainly use. And it also can come in a packing strip. Now, if you have a dry wound, um, we want to try to add moisture to that. And we can use transparent films. Um, like Tegaderm, the same thing that's used to you know, hold an IV in place. Um, these are impermeable to liquids and microbes, but they are permeable to moisture, vapor, and gas. And you can, it's useful for autolytic debridement, just letting the patient's own exudate white blood cells do the debridement. Frequently, we, I mean, we don't typically use this on its own, although there are cases where we do. Usually we're using this on top of another dressing to contain it to prevent from soiling and drainage. Um, other products we use with dry wounds would be hydrogels. These are made from water and glycerin. They donate moisture to the wound. And although it's not critical, if you get some outside the skin, it's OK uh, onto the skin. If you get too much, you can lead to some maceration. But you try to just put it in the wound bed. Um, the one on the right is collagen wound gel. This is the one we most commonly use. MediHoney, which is not really exactly a hydrogel, but the same basic concept. We also have the gel form of that. Um, and we have silver sorb gel, which is, is a hydrogel with silver in it. So those are options we have here in the hospital. Hydrocolloids, um, also frequently used in drier wounds. Um, but if the wound does have an exudate, it is able to absorb that into the dressing. It does end up making a thick colloidal gel. And generally speaking, I like to use it on clean to pressure, uh, stage two pressure ulcers. But it can't really be in areas that are prone to rolling. Because if it's on a she if the shear force, rolls against it, it just starts to gum up and roll up and come off. Um, so it has to be used in the right location. Another place it's really good for would be patients who have, say, fissures on their heels and are getting wounds. It's because they're just too dried out. These work well by keeping the moisture in place and allow those fissures to heal up. Um, and they, they will also like the tegaderms help with autolytic debridement. So what about these Goldilocks wounds, the ones where we were happy with the amount of drainage? Typically, we're using what are called interactive dressings. Um, these contain biologicals, which would be things like uh, bioengineered cellulose. And this helps to create a matrix. 
Um, they also contain collagen typically, usually a type 1 bovine or avian or a type 3 porcine collagen. And when we mix them together with the collagen and the oxidized cellulose, they will bind and protect growth factors and they inactivate matrix metalloproteinases. See, what happens in a chronic versus an acute wound, and there's, you, there, people have done bio, uh, you know, biochemistry studies where they've measured wound fluids from acute mastectomies versus from chronic venous leg ulcers. They, the fluid is different. Um, a matrix metalloproteinase is an enzyme that is breaking down um, tissue in order to pr uh, keep the inflammatory phase going. You know, part of you guys know a lot about the phases of wound healing, obviously. Um, the problem is these patients get stuck in that inflammatory phase because of these matrix metalloproteinases can be 30 times what you would see in, say, an acute mastectomy wound. So examples of these that we use all the time is Prisma and Promogran. They're the same product. It's just whether it has silver or not. Prisma has silver. Promogran doesn't. Um, just speaking a little bit on silver, it's not, not necessary to use silver all the time. It's, Prisma is four to five times more expensive than Promogran because of the silver. I would say that if someone doesn't have an infected wound, go ahead and use the non-silver product. And, if, they, and, and if, if you do use the silver product, there's really no use, need to use it for more than a couple weeks. Um, now, gauze dressings, uh, I, I, you know, when I first came here, um, you know, whenever I would get a surgery patient, consult pay, a patient to come to the office and see me, you know, I'd call the surgeon because I don't know anybody and I'm going to mess with their patient. And I remember I, I came here and I had this patient who self-referred from Dr. Westerman and he had a sternal wound. And I wanted to do a wound vac. It had been going on for quite a while. And I called Dr. Westerman and he said to me, what the hell are you doing? I've been doing this for 30 years. Wet to dry dressings work great. There's no reason to do anything else. And so um, I said, well, I'd like to try the wound vac and he, he reluctantly agreed to let me do it, and the patient did well. And what I'm trying to say is, is that, yes, wet to dry dressings are normal and standard, but there are other things you can do, especially in a chronic wound. If the patient's wound is not going as, as expected, it's time to think of something else. Now, I don't think, probably nowadays, I think most people feel that way. Um, but occasionally, I'll talk to somebody who still thinks that there's no reason to do anything other than a wet to dry. The problem with the gauze dressing is that the tissue is going to grow into the weave. And if you're going to do a wet to dry dressing properly, you're going to rip it off when it's dry. Because when you do that, you're going to be debriding the wound. And in cases where that's useful, then certainly go ahead and do it. I think paralyzed patients who have infected pressure ulcers, um, uh, wet to dry dressing is a, a great choice because you're going to debride the wound every time you change it. And they're not going to have pain. But if the patient is really having a lot of pain, I think there's better choices. Um, uh, and, and, you know, obviously if it desiccates all the way out, yes, you're going to be debriding the wound, but you're also going to be making it harder for some of the new epithelial cells and fibroblasts to grow. So secondary dressings. So after we put on whatever we want, what are we going to put on top of it? We generally are using foams and ABD pads. Foams are used more for mild to moderate drainage. They usually are non-adherent, so they don't hurt too much to remove. Free, and uh, uh, we also sometimes use them just to prevent pressure ulcer uh, patients in high-risk pressure ulcer patients in the ICU, we might put one of those heart-shaped sacral foam dressings to help prevent shearing forces. ABD pads are better for heavy drainage. Um, they are significantly cheaper. Some of our foam dr outer foam dressings can cost $10 or more each. Um, and if patients can't even afford an ABD pad, you can always recommend maternity pads, diapers. Those are options. They're the same basic, basic substance. Um, so you, you do have cheaper options. The, ba the types of foams that we use in the upper left, TL Plus, um, is a more, one of the more absorbent secondary dressings. Um, it is fairly well adherent and it is pretty water resistant. If the sides are stuck down, they can take a shower. The one in the upper right, OptiFoam Basic, it's basic. It's just foam, no adhesive, relatively inexpensive. My favorite dressing is the one in the lower left, the Tegaderm Oval Foams. It's, um, the Tegaderm really adheres well against um, joints, elbows, heels, knees. Um, and I find I've, I've worn it myself when I've gotten injured, and I find it very comfortable. The Mepilex Border, where we also use a TL Essential, but in the hospital here, I think it's the Mepilex, right? Where is it? TL? Oh, we're using TL Essential now. Same, same dressing. They use as a silicone adhesive, so it really does not um, cause skin problems, much less likely to cause a skin tear from removing the dressing. 
And then really the, one of the, the last basic, more or less, not really basic, but type of dressing, which I'm sure you all, you all use all the time, negative pressure wound therapy. The way it works is it does remove those pro-inflammatory um, exudative fluids. It will actually decrease the tissue pressure. You can actually measure that there's less pressure in the tissue, so there's less edema, edema fluid. It will remove those matrix metalloproteinases. It stimulates and, or it just removes and sucks out the senescent cells. Macrophages are mobilized under pressure. They move faster. It stimulates angiogenesis, improves the local oxygenation, and it does also activate the fibroblasts. Um, just to show you a little bit of data with this, in diabetic foot ulcers, um, these 342 patients uh, uh, had some significant improved healing. And the way you can really prove this, I think, is the fact that they had less amputations. That's a little something hard to massage the data on. Um, and in chronic leg ulcers, also been shown to be effective. Interestingly, pressure ulcers, it, there really aren't good studies out there to show whether it's effective or not, or, or not. I can tell you anecdotally, I think it works well as long as you've gotten rid of the pressure, um, but that's something that really doesn't have good data. Um, I'm going to show you a few more advanced things that we some, periodically, we used to use them more often in the wound center, but periodically they do get used. Um, Aplograph is grown from um, human foreskin. It gets the fibroblasts and keratinocytes. Um, it is approved for diabetic and venous leg ulcers. Um, and as you can see, this picture of a histograph, histology picture here, it's got all the layers of human skin except it doesn't have, have hair follicles, sweat glands, melanocytes, blood vessels. Um, it's not, you don't, it's not cross-matched or anything like that to a patient. That's what it looks like um, when it comes in the Petri dish. Um, we usually use, stab it with a, um, a 15 blade uh, on a gauze pad. Um, you can put it through a mesher if uh, you have a big wound and you want to use this. Um, and the FDA trials that they went through to get it approved showed improvement with venous uh, ulcers and diabetic ulcers. Another product that is a dermograph, which is just human foreskin fibroblasts. It doesn't have the keratinocytes. It's just approved for diabetic lower extremity ulcers. And it also um, uh, was, ha had some fairly good data with its FDA trial. Now, there's lots and lots of other bioengineered tissues. There's OASIS, A-cell. I know that Dr. Suarez and Dr. Schooler sometimes use A-cell. They use Integra. Epifix is made from placenta. There's Puriply is another um, bioengineered tissue. They, they're, they're, they're coming out all the time because some of them cost $10,000 each, and the vendors think they're the greatest thing you've ever heard of. Um, I think that they, when used appropriately, they are good, um, but not for every wound. I, I, I know, I can certainly see from some of the patients I've seen with the plastic surgeons that A-cell does help to get the wound beds well granulated for whatever procedure they may be doing later. Um, now moving on to venous ulcers, um, what I wanted to cover today is just compression choices and some on diagnosis. Obviously the treatment of venous ulcers I'm going to leave to, to the vascular surgeons because they'll tell you more about, about that. Um, now, compression, there's lots of different types of compression. How do you know which is the right one? What should you do? Uh, the Cochrane database in 2012 um, looked and evaluated many, many different types of, of studies looking at different types of compression systems. And what they found is that multi-component -comp systems are better than single-component systems at, for healing. Um, they also found that the two-component systems that had an elastic bandage are better than those that don't. Same is true also for the three component systems. They found the four layer bandage, which we use all the time, called, we, our brand is Compafor or Profor, um, uh, is, is more effective than using a short stretch bandage. Um, and that using a high compression stocking is more effective than using a short stretch bandage. Um, as far as cost effectiveness goes, it, they found that the four layer wrap is more cost effective than using just a single short stretch bandage. What they couldn't say anything about, because there was no good statistical evidence in the studies they reviewed, is a four layer compression wrap better than a two layer? There's a two layer brand called Coban 2. Um, it's cheaper. They couldn't find any uh, statistical difference between the two. A four layer wrap versus an Una boot, no, no difference. Um, using adjustable compression boots, the ones with Velcro, no difference to an Una boot. 
Um, the adjustable is just as good as a four layer. Single layer compression stockings just as good as an Una boot. Low compression stockings are just as good as uh, short stretch bandages. A two layer compression stocking is just as good as a four layer wrap. And tubular compression, which is what we frequently use on our inpatients here because they're easier to take on and off the tubi grips, is just as good as a short stretch bandage. Now, what is the compression nose classification? Uh, light is 16 to 20, class 1 is 20 to 30, 2 is 30 to 40, and 3 is 40 to 50. And I don't know how many of you have ever tried to put on a 40 to 50 compression stocking. It's really, really hard to do. A 30 to 40 is hard to do. Um, and think about it if you're 85 with arthritis. So Cochrane, again, as you can see, is one of my favorite things to look at to see if these studies actually show what they say. They found that when they compared class 3 and class 2 out five years, they didn't see any reduction in recurrence. And it really was because there's a higher compliance with class 2 than class 3. And so my take on this is pick the highest compression that your patient will actually do. Um, I think if someone is 35 and they have such bad varicose vein disease that they are getting pressure, um, vein, venous ulcers and they don't have arthritis, you know they have bad disease because what are they doing at 35 with an ankle ulcer? Try to get them in a 40 to 50 if you can or a 30 to 40. Um, because one, they probably know I hate this and they're willing to do it. And two, they're, they're physically able. If you have an 85-year-old patient with arthritis, you can write that prescription, but they're not going to wear it. I mean, I have patients all the time who come see me once a week, and they don't come in with their stocking and say, well, I knew I was coming in today, so I didn't put it on. And you know, they, just, they never wear it. So um, I find that in reality for these older patients, the 20 to 30 is what they're going to wear. Um, I bet Kevin probably finds the same thing. So. Um, uh, Compression stockings are really, as you see from that data before, they don't need a four-layer wrap. But compression stockings, if they wear them, work very well. Um, now, as far as di diagnosis, I don't think I need to tell you guys too much about this. Um, this is more when I talk to internal medicine docs. They, they, a lot of times they see the erythema from venous stasis. They think they have cellulitis, and they've been treating them over and over again with antibiotics, and they finally come to my clinic. And it's no, it's not that they've had recurrent cellulitis, although they could have had some episodes. It's that they're getting erythema from venous stasis. Anybody who has symptomatic venous disease of a C2S on the CEAP scale or greater, I think should get a venous competency um, uh, evaluation. And, but the venous ultrasound is highly tech dependent. Now, Kevin just left, and he could fill in on this more later, but from talking to him and, and Ed Lee, they think it's really important that the patients stand at some point during their venous ultrasound. Otherwise, they are, you aren't finding if they have reflux. And they have told me they're not too pleased with, the, with the, some of the ultrasounds that happen here because they're not having them stand. Um, so uh, I'm sure they've lectured to you before on the treatment of venous disease or well in the future. Um, so I, I have had patients who've had, quote, normal ultrasounds, haven't healed well, had them redone, and had, have had reflux found, have them, had them fixed, and their wound goes away. Um, also, you know, venous ulcers for me are something that I get a lot of clinical satisfaction from because they come into the office, you compress them, and all of a sudden they start to get better and they, you know, can heal up in four weeks, eight weeks, what have you. Um, but if you're doing that, you're doing the right things, and they're not healing as expected, you really need to think biopsy because these are the ones that are most likely to be different than what you think. When someone has an arterial ulcer, it's pretty obvious. You know, they've got the punched out ulcer on the, on the malleolus. They've got a poor pulse exam. I mean, it's, that's what it is. Pressure may be contributing, but you know that's what it is. These venous ulcers, you can get tricked. They can be lividoid vasculopathy or atrophy blanche. It can be pyoderma gangrenosum. It could be a skin cancer. It could be a vasculitis. So I would say it's not that you need to biopsy these patients when you first see them, but if they aren't responding, they should be biopsied. Now, moving on to arterial. Um, you know, this patient here that uh, came in about a week or two after having their toenail excised, I could palpate the dorsal pedis and posterior tibial pulses. Of course, he's diabetic. The picture on the right is one week after the picture on the left, which was two weeks after the toenail excision. He did go on to have a below-the-knee amputation. Um, when 
to, to, to the, the topics I wanted to bring up, and I know some of the residents had mentioned they wanted to know about, well, how can we test for perfusion without doing an angiogram? Um, what, and and what, how can we use this information to predict healing? Now, the ABI, which is, of course, this, everybody knows how to do, um, uh, it's not a really good test. And in 2016, Cochrane looked at this and <laughs> said the evidence about the accuracy of ABI for the diagnosis of PAD is sparse. The normal is considered 0.9 to 1.3. If they're less than 0.8, it's considered diagnostic for PAD. And of course, diabetic patients can get all calcified and we can't get an accurate reading out of them. So what do we do if we don't, can't really trust this? Well, we have better perfusion studies. Uh, we have supplemental non-invasive arterial studies, which is a transcutaneous oxygen monitoring, or also sometimes called TCPO2, which is transcutaneous um, uh, oxygen, uh, or just TCPO2, transcutaneous PO2. We also can check laser Doppler flowmetry, pulse volume recordings, and toe pressures. Uh, TCOM is something that we don't have available on an inpatient basis here, but we do have at the wound care center. Um, and what this is, is we take an electrode that we place in the area of interest, um, and that electrode is heated to 45 centigrade. Um, it, that causes localized hyperemia, which dissolves the lipid structure. Um, of the dead epidermal cells, which will allow the gas to perfuse through there. And the detector, when we have it on the machine calibrating without hookup to anybody, it reads 160 here because we're at sea level. If you were in Denver, it would read lower than that. It reads oxygen molecules hitting the membrane. So when we put it on the skin, we're not measuring a pulse ox. We're actually measuring how many oxygen molecules hit the detector. It takes about 15 minutes to reach stable baseline. And most machines can do four or more at a time. We, ours can do four. Um, and um, I get consults from the vascular surgeons asking me to do more than one of these, to do it, say, on a TMA flap area, a BKA flap above the knee, so they can know, well, what's the perfusion to make decisions? Well, is this a TMA patient, a BKA, or so on? So if you do have somebody and you want to know because you're not comfortable with their exam, where are they likely to be able to heal? Where can, where, where's the flap most likely to be successful? We can do that test for you. We also use this in our hyperbaric oxygen chambers to assess whether or not we're actually getting any extra oxygen to their foot. We will put this on, baseline it out of the chamber. We may get 10 millimeters of mercury, 15 millimeters of mercury. We'll put them in at 2 or 2.4 atmospheres of 100% oxygen and we'll usually read over 500 millimeters of mercury, sometimes 1,000. Um, so it's a useful test for us. Um, TCOM, the data on using it to predict healing is as expected. The higher your TCOM uh, level, the better. Uh, in 1999, someone studied an evaluation of 50 diabetic patients and found that the 13 who had TCOMs of less than 25 did poorly. 11 of them did, did poorly. The 37 who were greater than the 25 34 of them ended up improving or healing. This study was repeated in 2013 and basically showed the same results with better statistical analysis. They did the area under the curve analysis and showed that 25 millimeters of mercury appears to be the cutoff to help determine whether someone is able to heal. Now, laser Doppler flowmetry is something you can order here in the hospital. Um, I, I'm probably a, you've probably seen this before. Um, what we're measuring is the skin perfusion pressure. There's a laser probe that is placed over the area of interest. We can do it on the hallux, on the, anywhere on the foot, the ankle, the calf. Um, we can't do it on the other smaller toes. The cuff won't fit, so it's just the hallux. Um, so we place that laser probe in the angiosome, the area of interest that we're worried about. We, we're looking for reactive hyperemia. Um, so the laser, what it's going to do is detect when the blood starts to move for, at first, first starts moving. We inflate the cleft to, to occlude it, gently release the pressure, and then we can graph what's going on. Um, this just shows you what the computer shows. You don't actually have to, if you want, tell whoever's doing this test exactly where to put the probe, although you can. They can go onto the computer and push where the wound is. It knows where the angiosomes are supposed to be, and it will tell them where to put the probe to, to measure the flow in the area of interest. When the results come out on the machine, um, and our machine does left and right at the same time. So in this patient, you'll see in the right foot, it starts to rise at 70 millimeters of mercury. And in the left foot, it's starting to rise at 24. That indicates that there is a perfusion abnormality to the left foot. 
We also will get graphs of, of the waveforms. Um, and you can see, well, is, do we have triphasic, biphasic, monophasic, whatever. Um, our machine is going to tell you we're going to measure at the calves, at the ankles, and in the feet. Um, and I think that it's really useful to see. I mean, if you have triphasic waveforms in the calves and you got monophasic in the ankles, you already know, okay, there's probably a stenosis somewhere in between there. What's the data on this? It's as expected, same, similar as the TCOM. The higher the perfusion, the more likely you are to heal. Patients with 30 millimeters of mercury or perfusion were much more likely to heal than those with 15. Um, and then you can use this not just to predict beforehand, but also to evaluate how successful was whatever um, intervention procedure you've done. SPP checked after endovascular therapy. Uh, was most recently reported in 2014, a fairly large study of 113 patients with critical limb ischemia who had an angioplasty and or stent. And they had their SPPs checked before and within 48 hours of their procedure. And it appears that 30 millimeters of mercury predicts whether or not they're going to heal. So I, I would say that, that these kinds of evaluations are things you should do if you're going to be considering an amputation on somebody. Um, and, and help to you to make a decision whether you should be considering an amputation on somebody. Yeah? You can do either one. We at the Wound Center do the skin perfusion pressure because, one, it's faster, and it seems to be less affected by edema than the TCOM. But really, it's a, it's a speed issue. And I think that the data, looking at them, they're very much equivalent. I mean, I, I think that it's not very common. I mean, sometimes we'll have patients where we've done both. It's pretty rare where I get a, a, a clinically significant different reading between the two. Um, so, but also I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's a cheap, inexpensive test. Um, uh, I think if somebody has a wound, um, you know, you, you may not necessarily need to have the study right afterwards, because the wound is going to be your study. You're going to see, well, is the wound better next week? Is it starting to get better? I think, uh, um, but e whether they have it or not, just having more information to know, well, was this a successful procedure or not, I think it's a good thing. I don't know how often the vascular surgeons here are checking this after the procedure. Um, um, I know they, they do. I don't know how often, though. Um, so um, I'm just going to go over one last thing, and I'll take some questions. Just what. If you wanted to, there's an easy way. If you want to send us the patient to the wound center now with Cottage One, you can actually put the order in. It'll come to us, and we'll call and schedule the appointment for you. Um, if you go to the discharge hub, and then you go up to the top under where it says three for new orders, and you type in that additional order search bar, and you type in uh, wound or wound referral or Ridley Tree, all that. If you see ambulatory referral to wound, Ridley Tree Wound Center, that's us. If you submit that order, it will go to us and we'll call the patient. So we've tried to make it easy for you um, for getting these patients sent to us as an outpatient. So any questions? Well, I haven't had any experience with it, so I just don't know. Um, uh, I mean, that's obviously going to be an inpatient setting. Um, so I haven't done it. I, I don't see why it would not be helpful, um, especially if you're, you obviously, I assume you're doing it because it's an infected wound. Um, to try and clear the infection. 24, oh, 24,000 bucks, okay. There are cheaper things you can do. Um, I, I think, uh, to me, when I evaluate our, our, our we call it Vazimed, that's the company that makes the machine. So they give us the skin perfusion pressure and they gave us the waveforms. Truthfully, I find the, the waveforms are, are more helpful because uh, I can usually tell from looking at somebody if their perfusion is poor, um, just well, they've got a wound in this location. It looks like it's probably, not, their perfusion's probably not very good. But the waveforms kind of tell how likely it is that you're going to do an arterial ultrasound that's going to show some, some abnormality. I mean, if they've got triphasic waveforms and they've got a bad skin perfusion pressure, I'm going to think, well, maybe I should repeat that because that skin perfusion pressure can't be that low. They've got triphasic waveforms unless there's someone who really has some really, really poor small vessel disease that has had no effect on their macrovascular circulation. So those machines that just do the waveforms are cheaper 
um, I don't know how much cheaper. So if there was a cost issue, I would say, okay, get 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 the waveform machine, uh, get the waveforms. Good luck with it. What are your thoughts on that? I, yeah, I, I mean, there's data that shows that just putting sugar on a wound is better yeah. than. So you know, the thing about the Medi honey is it's special honey. It's Manuka honey from New Zealand, um, and. Uh, they're selling the Santa Barbara honey. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm guessing that, I mean, I, I can't, I'm pretty soon you're going to probably get like special Mendocino marijuana honey, you know? <laughs> and um, I, I don't know if it's, I, 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 I'm sure it works. Um, um, I don't really know. I can't tell you that the Manuka honey really is better than Santa Barbara honey. Yeah, and, and uh, also maggots. Oh, that was Maggots. We haven't Are done. Ma I mean, we it, we haven't done maggot therapy in our clinic in probably three years. Um, you can do it. It's just it's kind of it's a lot of work to get it done. Um, patients don't really like it, um, <laughs> and it, you know I think the the rash the, the use of maggots is more for that patient that cannot tolerate any bedside debridement. I mean, if you can if they. You know, maybe some with bad arterial disease where you wanted to breed them, but don't, you, you can't because of that. Or I, the patients who have used it on also really painful radiation ulcers where you just, they can't handle debridement, but it's just filled with all that nasty stuff. Those are the ones we've used maggots on. Do you bother with that at all? We certainly check them. And we How much does that hinder? Oh, it, it, you know, our, our troublemaker patients have hemoglobin A1Cs of 13, 14. That's why they're troublemaking patients. And you don't get there without being somebody who doesn't follow directions. So um, the, it goes without saying, the lower the better. Um, and so we, we check eight hemoglobin A1Cs on our patients when they come in. We counsel them. We get nutrition consults if needed, send them to the endocrinologist. I mean, it's, it's very, very important. All right, thank you. Thank you.